Welcome, everybody, to another interview on the Triple B Experience. I'm your host, Bad Bubba Brewer. And this evening, we have a slew of individuals tonight. I will get them here momentarily, one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. It's all three of them in here. They are uh, part of a film company, and they're going to talk about it tonight and how they got into it and all the logistics of film making and acting and writing and all that stuff. So. First and foremost, his name is Michael Gaffner. He's an award-winning director and studio executive for the Moi Media Works. He's also a crow creator in a lot of series. Michael, welcome to the show. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, I don't have a webcam going, so that name, Enigmatic Luminary? I'm so enigmatic, you don't even get to know what I look like. <laughs> That's so cool. That's Okay. You just, you know, you're, you're very distinguished when you're talking, so that's what it's all about anyway. So I'm sure you uh, can uh, put yourself over like Rover, I'm sure. So, but thanks for coming on tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Okay, next up, it's an, he's an award-winning screenwriter. He's the head writer for Ma Film Works Company. He's the chief content officer. Now, sometimes I mess up names because I've had a lot of concussions, but I went through this 16 times, but... Hopefully, I don't mess it up. If I do, I'm deeply sorry. His name is Adam Rusta. Adam, did I get it right? I, I uh, to... Almost, almost, oh, almost. Geez. If it's okay. any consolation, you didn't mess it up. Ellis Island did many, many years ago. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the show. I'm, uh, I'm very uh, interested on both of you guys. Now we got one more to make this the tripod of the the film industry here. So. Next but not least, uh, he was one of my nemesis very stir uh, when we I started in wrestling a long, long time ago in the Allied Powers Wrestling Federation. He was the manager of champions. He went under the name Hollywood Johnny Tambo. Now the Hollywood gimmick is real because he's been uh, been in various acting credentials in films for many, many years, and he's going to talk about it. But he's also a vice president of the Darken Theater Films. And he's also in Media Works Company also. So it's my pleasure to welcome Hollywood Johnny Tambo, but his real name is Todd Bertheneth. Close enough. How you doing? I messed up You've that got too. a lot of nerves showing your face around here after what you pulled, Bubba. Yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry, Hollywood. And, and, that's, and, that's, and that's a good monarchy for you guys. Hollywood, all you guys. It's something that you guys, let me ask you guys. I'll start with Michael first. Is it something that you always wanted to do in your life, Michael, as I'll go around the whole panel? Yeah. So basically the way the story goes when I tell it, which is the true story, is that I was sitting back in well, 1993, 94, just watching Jurassic Park for the first time. And I didn't know it because I was so young, but that was basically everybody's first time seeing computer generated imagery that looks so real like that. And that struck mm -hmm. me as like a three or four year old kid as one of the most amazing experiences that I had had up to that point. And when I saw directed by Steven Spielberg at the end, I didn't quite know it yet, but I knew that name was important to how that movie came out. And I knew someday I wanted my name there and under that credit. And that's essentially where the start came from. For me, we started making uh, with the other uh, co with another co-founder who's not here tonight. His name is Andrew Hulse. We started making, our own kind of stupid little films, like starting right around 1998, maybe a little bit before, but it wasn't organized before that. It wasn't even really organized then, but that's, that's essentially, that's how it happened. Okay. Adam, how did you get your feel for this movie industry? Honestly, I'm not even sure. Uh, I remember two key points. Uh, I always enjoyed creating my own stories. I, I always wanted to be in control of my own, my own universes, my own characters. And, and even when I was a kid and, you know, play was important, I would have like three act structures to everything that I did. So I was always in that mindset. And I also remember there was a career day in like second grade or something like that. And uh, they they had all these books on on different careers you could have, you know, when you grow up. They had doctors and nurses and lawyers and, you know, the cooks and just everything. And I, I remember looking at it and saying, I don't want to do any of this crap. <laughs> but I had this 
this uh this thing you know i had this this specialty that i kind of just naturally grew and then uh, eventually i put a name to it and that was writing and then writing became screenwriting because i i just have more fun doing screenwriting than i do novelization or anything else i can do it all but when i screenwrite i can get excited not only for my own projects but for other people's and and i don't know i just think it's an extension of how i was as a child you know it, and here i am today you know oh that's awesome now getting to you yeah. mr hollywood johnny tambo did you have a lifelong uh, ambition to get in i know it's hollywood as your monarchy but did you have an ambition <laughs> to get into Hollywood uh, when you were younger? Absolutely. Uh, far back as I can remember, I was always writing scripts for stupid little movies and so forth like that. My, my cousin and I always, we didn't have video cameras back then, so we had to do audio cassette tapings of us doing skits and so forth. So it's always been something I wanted to do. And uh, then in 2011, a friend of mine from Pittsburgh, Angela Rocca, Angela, you're still my spirit animal posted about the uh, open casting call for the uh, call for the dark knight rises so i just uh, you know signed up for it to say i did it and surprised i got it you know so that was awesome and it just bloomed from there okay so uh let uh, go back to michael so when you were younger michael did anybody give you any type of positive uh feedback when you wanted to try to do this or yeah was it and more well negative? It was mostly negative. I remember t talking to my, and this is, none of it came from my mother, by the way, who was a writer. Um, it all came from my father. Uh, I love you, dad. You're probably not going to watch this, but I love you anyway. Um, <laughs> anyway, and he was, I was like, I want to be a movie director. And I was always told, be realistic. And then I was like, okay, then I want to be a professional wrestler. I'm just kidding. I made that up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's nobody in that. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, but that's essentially what it was. Be realistic. And that's what I've heard basically my whole life up until even recently when, you know, we've been able to pull things together and even he's come around and begun to kind of think, yeah, you might have actually made the right, made, you might be on the right track actually. <laughs> so. Okay. Adam? How about you? Honestly, my experience is mostly good. There's a few things that I'll talk about that like shaped other things, I'm sure. But uh, as far as my experience, my English teachers were always inspirational towards it. Um, I remember in I, as as quickly as I could write, I was getting like different textbooks and stuff or uh, like notebooks, those old composition books they used to give out mm -hmm. in like elementary and middle. Yeah, so they they give me, you know, as many as I needed, and I just fill them with different stories. And um, I remember there was one time when there was like a, a three-minute play we had to do on a leaf in fall. I ended up turning in, in fifth grade, like 52 pages, because I just kept writing and writing oh, yeah. and writing. <laughs> and um, they, they always took it the way... I think I wanted it to be taken, which was, oh, wow, okay, so so you're, you know, this is like a thing. Uh, so I, I had a lot of inspiration from just many of my English teachers. They all seemed to uh, really want me to go on this path, and here I am. Nice, nice. Okay, Mr. Tambo, how about you? Yeah, everyone always knew this was the direction I was headed uh, in my high school yearbook they always did that like you're gonna be the next sports star or the next whatever i was the next stand-up comedian so they knew i was heading in this direction at least that far back <laughs> okay yeah. Yeah. so uh, did you guys have any is there that is that that let me go one person that was just not agreeing with you and was negative because we all have those uh nilly individuals that don't want us to strive for better. Does any of you guys ever had that one person that you can think of that was just not a, a positive influence or inv they weren't positive in your environment when you guys were growing up, like school-wise anyway? Um, you know how kids are, you know. Anybody? I mean, I definitely I mean, did. But it wasn't really yeah. related to movie stuff. It was more related to my left-handedness that I – I, uh, that I used to be and still am, but can't right now, thanks to this teacher. I'm not going to go name names here, but yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Adam? I know who it is. 
Uh, so school wasn't really where my problems were. Uh, my home life was was rough. Um, I I my father had a brain tumor that uh, took a lot of his ability to process emotion out, and and so. Um, when it came to things that he didn't understand, it was immediately aggravating for him. So for someone like me, who um, I I would spend every waking moment just basically making up fancy, uh, he, he, you know, wanted something a little more real, a little more grounded. So he was not the happiest person. Let's let's just say there's there's reports out there of him not being that happy with me. <laughs> So, um, we won't go into too much detail over that, but at the same time, I mean, home life was a hell of a lot less, um, inspirational than, uh, school life. Although I will say, uh, my father grew up wanting to be a writer and I can't deny the fact that, uh, he's a lot of why I discovered a lot of what I can do. Uh, even if he didn't try to be that person, uh, there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of him in me. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Tambo? No specific person. I think it's just the fact that I was born in the wrong decade. I mean, back when I was should have gotten to this originally, there was no internet. So I didn't even know it was even possible to do any of this kind of stuff. I thought you had to go to, like, California to do all this. But, I mean, once in a while you'd see something filming nearby, like in Pittsburgh, like Gung Ho filmed in Pittsburgh back in, what was it, 86, I think? Right, yeah. Slapshot was before my time. Uh, but yeah, it was yeah, in the seventies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Just bad timing. Hmm. But let's just say you guys all had to. Did you guys take? Um, once again, I'll go through all three. I'll start with Michael. Uh, the classes that you did in school, uh, get into college. Did you have um, the, the degree to further your filmmaking abilities with your education, Michael? So I did. That wasn't my original plan. I went through various career choices, including uh, music composition and becoming a professional chef. Uh, I'm not professional, but I can certainly outcook most people. Um, anyway, but I ended up going to film school. It was it became kind of a spur of the moment thing. I was already pretty good at, at that point at what I wanted to do. I hadn't yet brought branched out beyond the uh, directing and well, sound engineering actually is where that is what I did before that. But um, there was a, there was a, there was another, another friend of mine convinced me just right at the spur, just on the spur of the moment. One day we were writing a script and he says, yeah, I'm going to film school here in a couple of months. You should try last minute and see if you can get in. And it was at a place called Dubois business college, which isn't around anymore. But at the time the program oh, was wow. taught by um, uh, John Russo and Russ Striner, uh, Russ Striner being the producer of Night of the Living Dead and John Russo being the writer of Night of the Living Dead. And I thought, you know what? This sounds like good. These sound like good connections to make. I'm going to take him up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this friend of mine up on his uh, suggestion and I'm going to go to film school. And I applied and got easily accepted. I was a last minute addition. So I ended up missing some, some, some dates at the beginning, not dates for classes, but dates for things like orientation and whatnot. Um, but I did get in, so yeah, that's wow. Dubois, Dubois had that. I did not. I did not know that. Yeah, it was somewhat brief. It was only for like a what, like a seven or eight year period there. But but yep, yep, they had it. Wow. And you you hooked up with those two individuals that you talked about that probably helped you get into a little bit more, right? Uh, yeah. So, well, they definitely afforded me some opportunities to kind of expand my skill set in ways that at the time I didn't really realize I needed. Cause I, I mean, I, like I said, I was already pretty good at what I could, what I was wanting to do at that time. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to college, I immediately went to college with a big head on my shoulders. So they were also okay. pretty good at evening that out a little bit too. A little gotcha. bit, not much. I still have a big head on my shoulders. Seriously, you should see me sometime, but not today. <laughs> okay, won't be on camera. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, Adam, how did uh, your schooling and education get you into the, where you're at now with the, you know, screenwriting and movies and all that other stuff? Did you have that kind of uh, credentials? Uh, I didn't really have credentials. I had street smarts. Uh, street oh, smarts wow. made by the fact that, yeah. So um, you know, 
long story short, uh, I was diagnosed with uh, low spectrum autistic disorder or Asperger's when I was 19. Didn't know it up upwards to 19, but one of the, the nice little things about Asperger's is that we like to hyper-focus on what we like. Well, I like mm -hmm. to write. So uh, in English, I would, I would write. In science, I would write. Uh, math class, I would write. <laughs> you know, there, there was this pattern. Um, most of it uh, was a little bit harmful to my education, to be honest, mm -hmm. but um, I learned how to write. I, I learned that, that three act, five act, seven act structure that they have nowadays. Um, I, I, I know how to create a character. I, I know how to uh, tell a story, but it's, it's been, you know, just hours and hours and hours and hours upon hours of writing. Uh, school itself, I, the, biggest thing that they did was uh even though they recognized you know where my failings were they recognized where my strengths were um and and they still helped me with my writing while also helping me through school eventually i you know i i did get through high school i did get out of high school i was going to go to college um i was looking at the um uh, Full Sail University, actually okay. where NXT is, uh, mm -hmm. Full Sail University, that grounds. Um, I was looking at that. I was also looking at the New York Film Academy, uh, which is near NYU, although it's not connected to NYU. It's actually an offshoot of Juilliard, I believe. Um, but I, I actually went up there uh, for WrestleMania 29, by the way. Okay. Uh, and I, I did both. I, I did a walkthrough of that college and, and then went to the show. Uh, so um, I was looking at colleges. I've, I've been, you know, wanting to go the rest of my life here. But uh, money has always been that thing that kind of keeps me away from it. You know, I don't I really want to be in debt. I don't really like to be in debt, uh, you know. I'd like a plus sign in front of my numbers. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with you there, Adam. Uh, Tambo, how how did uh, did you have any uh, education in college and stuff like that, or you just went off on a tangent and just did what you were doing? No, I went to Penn State and I took a lot of video and audio classes and so forth like that. That nice. That was it. Was a lot of networking back then before Facebook and social media and so forth. Uh, my roommate at the time also was into making videos and so forth, so classes that he took that i wasn't in i got to help out with his stuff and vice versa so it was a, a lot of shaking each other's hands kind of thing back then and then a really good thing was uh, tom savini came to uh, do a lecture at penn, penn state's where i went and mm -hmm. i got to pick his brain for a while and do an on-camera interview with him and that was just a great experience oh i bet i bet well speaking of networking how did the three of you guys uh meet and uh you know form this um business friendship relationship whatever you want to call it and i'll start with you uh johnny how did you how did you meet uh michael and adam michael i met in pittsburgh at a casting call for season two of uh outsiders that was on wgn america for two seasons back then it was my the first season i was a townie but then i, I started growing my beer so i got to be a feral up on mount shea and i met him in line michael in line there and we got to talking and so forth uh, Adam, I, I think he hated me at first. <laughs> How do you say? Why would you say that, Michael? <laughs> I just—it's my—that's my default. My default opinion of how people think of me at first. I'm first impressions. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know that's funny. Um, Adam, so Adam, I met through Michael. Okay, yeah. okay. For the, for the so... Howitzer Tales project. Mm -hmm. And Michael talking about that, I'm sure, most definitely. So, um, Michael, how did you and Adam meet then? Since So, um, I'll let Adam tell most of this story if he chooses to. But back in 2014, we were working on what's – so down in Pittsburgh, you guys have a – There's a well, it's not just Pittsburgh. It's several cities, but this was Pittsburgh. There are There's a film competition called the 48-Hour Film Project, which is where you go down, they give you – a uh, character name, a line of dialogue, a prop, and a genre, and maybe some more stuff. I don't remember what it's what it's like these. I don't know what it's like these days. Um, but anyway, you have to make a film that has all of those elements in it, 
within 48 hours and then turn it in. And then there's a screening and whatnot. There's a festival with awards and whatnot. And we had assembled a team. We weren't Ma Filmworks. We weren't working under the Ma Filmworks banner at the time, although I did have the studio then. We were working under a makeup uh, with other uh, makeup group with other people, and we called ourselves because we were associated with the Boonies International Film Festival up here in Warren, Pennsylvania, which is it, which is defunct now, but it, it lasted a good few years. But also, we had people from Dubois involved. We called our team the 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 uh, Dubunatics. <laughs> and that's how we ended up meeting is um, we needed a writer. And I can't remember, was I the one that reached out to you, Adam? Yeah, you and okay. Michelle both. Michelle. Um, Michelle from the Historical Society. Oh, Norm. right, right. Okay, that's right. I remember that. So, but yeah, Michael, how did you reach out to Adam? Which, which way or how did you know about him to reach oh, out to I'm him? pretty sure through facebook which is how a lot of this goes mm. right now okay <laughs> and then then um I'm i can always... add to that okay yeah i'll let i'll let adam add more to it because he, he he's there's more to this there's more to this story that, that concerned him i was the director on the project which means after we had our initial meetings i immediately went and fell asleep until shooting the next day and never saw adam again until a couple of years later so <laughs> That's yeah. what the, is that what directors usually do? Is that how it goes? So the 48-hour <laughs> film project can kind of be like that. Okay. But this one wasn't run particularly well. Mm. But gotcha. I mean, it was run okay. We did turn in a complete project. It, it, it performed well, but I'll let Adam get into that. So okay. it was it was well enough, I think. It was Vic. Um it's on it's on YouTube. I wouldn't play it for the faint of heart because of all the screaming and stuff, but uh <laughs> um but it, yeah, I I met Mike uh kind of out of the blue. So I was uh I had just come off of a play in Warren cuz that's kind of where I was cutting my teeth on writing uh was I just I kept meeting people who were excited to put me into things. And I was just like, sure, yeah, why not? And I ended up writing for the Historical Society a murder mystery straight from the ground up called uh, uh, Woman of the French Doors. And uh, it was a three-act structure. It was based off of a, a real... Um, a real mystery in, woman where, or, uh, in Warren where this woman... Uh, it, who was thought to have like the perfect relationship in the 1920s was seen just running out of her house bawling. And she ends up getting hit by a train that used to go right through the center of our, of our town. And There's you know, the body car, was dragged yeah. like, yeah, it, it was a bigger thing than uh, just a cable car. It was a full size train. Was it? They used to, oh, I know what you're, yeah, what you're used to pull about, logging yeah. and stuff, but uh, yeah. So, I wrote a, a what if story basically, and and we had a, a dinner theater type of deal, and um, it was it was it was a very eye opening experience because not only was that my script that was written, I was also the director, I was also the person sourcing things, so it it, it showed me in real time how to do all of that in a setting where there were enough hands and eyes watching over me that if I needed help, there was someone to help me. It was a great experience. I, I could not ask for a better entry point into any of this than that particular play and that particular experience with that particular cast and crew, because the cast was extremely patient with all of my greenery. Um, but, uh, from that, uh, the person who ran it had a, had a, apparently good experience with the whole thing was really happy with it. I uh, did it the next following couple of years with uh, other people and other things. And um, she actually told Mike about me. Mm -hmm. And so he reached out to me, I think on Facebook and was just like, Hey, we've got this thing going on. Do you want to be a part of a, a writing team? And uh, I, I went and I did the, uh, the, the team of writers for it. Um, this was my first time writing an actual screenplay that was going to be seen. Um, I got to go down and and uh, actually be experience the whole thing from the ground up. Oh, yeah, so, you rode down. I drove us all down. Yeah, 
I, I, yeah. Uh, so I wrote down with Michael and the actress that was in it. And uh, I think Dave Clark was the Dave other Clark, one, right? Dave Mike? Clark was there, yep. And we went down, uh, we got a, a road show with a mannequin and there was there was a line of dialogue. It's the first line of dialogue in Vic, and I can't think of it. But we got those three things as Don't our thing checked. because, yeah. Oh yes, yep. Um, so uh, the forty eight hour film festival gives you certain things you have to have in your film, and you've got two days mm -hmm. to write it, produce it, the whole nine yards. And uh, so we did, uh, but we didn't want to do a traditional like road show with like. Oh yeah, we we you know took magic mushrooms and hijinks ensued, and you know you know how those gotcha. road shows normally go, you know right. teenage shows, lowbrow mm -hmm. comedy. Uh, so what we did is uh, in the car we we thought of kind of this thing where where it's just this this couple that that were really just like sweet and innocent and you know just lovable. And they get pulled over for a minor violation. And they're talking to a dummy in the back because that, that was our prop. And uh, slowly over time, you realize there's something wrong with these sweet, innocent, you know, married couple. And it turns out they're traffickers. And and oh. so it, it, it has this edge to it that's just, you know, real, real dark. It's not the way the final script turned out. I kind of wish that it, it was a little more like that because the final script is a little more blunted in my opinion uh but it was a it was a team of three writers and and we all pitched in and and had to work you know off of each other and it was the final product so um i've i've gotten to work on other projects and things like that because of that one experience mike and i you know we get along famously and um i Nothing was different for that. For what we we got to know each other during that time, I mean, it left an impression in both of our heads. So the next time we saw each other, I think it was just on the street. You know, I, I think we were both just happen chance at, at a bar called Fats, you know. And uh, so we started talking there. The and that, was, that was all she wrote. We started working out from there. So... When did the concept of the, this film company come together and how did it originate? Um, did, did Michael, did you start it and then everybody else joined in or how so, is the concept of that? So, yeah. So the Ma Filmworks company, which is what we're known as nowadays, uh, I, I recognized earlier you, you took my information off of Facebook and I realized I never updated my job from when we were called Ma Media Works, which was the previous <laughs> yeah. incarnation of this company. There have actually been three incarnations of this company. There are three distinct eras. There was the original, okay. which was Ma Filmworks. And then there was Ma Media Works, which we started in 2018. We closed down the original Ma Filmworks and rebranded re as this because the idea was we're going to branch out and do things other than film because there's not a lot of film work in Warren, Pennsylvania. And um, when we when we reincorporated here in what January of 2021 or January of 2022, um, or was it June? I think it was June actually. We went back to the idea of the Ma, of Ma Filmworks, but because the rules required us to have the word company in there, I changed it to the Ma Filmworks company because it looks better written down. Okay. Anyway, how this all started was, like I said, back in like 1998, it was myself and another guy, Andrew Hulse, and we were just kids at the time, like eight years old, and we were just making these stupid videos, and we called ourselves Mike and Andy Studios back then. So you have an M and you have an A. Well, then circa 2007 or so, we met this, we started hanging out with this third guy who was also interested in the film business. This is the guy who got me to go to film school. His name is Wes Cochran. And we ended up cre kind of creating this high, this organization. We called ourselves Ma Studios. And we weren't incorporated yet. We just called ourselves that. And we ended up not being able to use that name because there was a furniture studio, I think a uh, furniture company in Rochester, I believe, that was called Ma Studios. Oh, so then God. we changed it to Ma Productions. And I was all like, this is going to be great. And then we found out there was a furniture company in, I think, Buffalo called Ma Productions. They were not related businesses, by the way. So by the time we got into college, which we were still Ma Productions at the time, by the time we got into college together, 
and I was looking at incorporation, I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to create something that nobody else has. And I was playing a game at the time called uh, The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim made by a company called Bethesda Softworks. And I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to take the soft out and throw film in there. And we're the Ma, we're, we're Ma Filmworks now. And Ma stood for um, M-A-W, Mike, Andy, and Wes. Um, nowadays, there's just Mike left, and there's Adam, and there's there's Todd here, and we have a few other people now. Um, Andy and so, Wes are So not- the three of you guys right now are the tripod of this company. Um, yeah, yeah, basically I'd Hmm. say that's, that's, that's pretty true. We're the ones that meet the most regularly. (laughs) And each one of you guys have a different job duty or do you guys all do everything? Like I know Todd acts, you know, but does he do a whole bunch of more stuff than just act or would he be your lead or your, your actor where you always got him plus a little bit of other stuff? Well, we usually have him in an acting role, uh, less so recently, only in so far as because things have been chaotic for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. But um, Todd's also ex- extremely valuable behind the scenes, or, or even especially when it comes to things like the writing process, um, as Adam is as well. Adam is a writer. Right. So, uh, okay. so am I, but I don't write well unless I bounce ideas off of other people. So that's what, what I like to do here. Okay. Okay, so I'm just getting a whole form of this. So you guys would have like a, a production meeting. It would be the three of you guys, and then if you guys get anybody else in 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 your um, on your team, they would become a part of the production team, also. Yes, yeah, and we have a pretty full production team at the moment. Right now, there's only three of us right now, but there's probably like four other people or so that are part of the core team. I don't. There might be more. I'm just not good at math. Um, actually I'm serviceable at math, but I just like to say that because it's an excuse. Um, okay. So, yeah, so that, basically the way it breaks down is I'm kind of your director figurehead, so to speak. Adam okay. will write the thing and Todd's very good at corralling the thing and helping with writing the thing. Um, uh, cor- uh, corralling talent. He's good at, like we wouldn't have found you without Todd. So, oh. Oh. so that, that, that's, that's, well, that's what you. we do. Thanks um, Hollywood. Yeah, so so it's my fault, Bubba. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. So so Todd is your will be your talent, like your talent coordinator, your talent relations guy, going out and try if he sees somebody that fits roles and parts, he would send them to you, Michael, and say, Hey, I got this person. Yeah, check them out. Mm-hmm. Okay. There's there's a lot of that. Yeah. I mean, we all kind of the thing is we it, it doesn't really break down according to job. We all just mm-hmm. kind of do We're, all the stuff. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Which okay. is unfortunate most times. Because there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> well, but also too, you guys are all taking the whole equal load, and and you guys, it's all three of you guys are doing it. That means you guys are all putting all your effort into it, and then everybody else could, uh, you know, look at you guys and say, "Hey, you guys are doing what you need to be doing to get this company going and making it successful." Because I don't know how a, I don't know how uh, an independent I don't know how an independent movie company would do that so i don't know how do you get your resources for the financial part of it though uh mostly most mostly robbing convenience stores uh no I'm oh, just okay oh, I'm that's just awesome yeah, I'm okay just um, bubba bubba you know this phrase hot dog on a handshake yeah yes i do yes <laughs> yes yes okay so so, so <laughs> wow real realistically Everything that we've done so far has been internally funded, which means it comes out of my pocket or mm-hmm. Adam's pocket, and sometimes Todd's pocket. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's another member of Ma that's not here tonight because she doesn't do the whole studio thing. Her name is Tammy. She's actually our chief financial officer, so basically at some point it's all in her pocket. Well, metaf- metaphorical pocket, not mm-hmm. for real. Okay. And that's that's kind of that's kind of how we do things. Uh, you know, we've done some independent fundraising and whatnot, but a lot of it's just blood, sweat, and tears, and most of it just being blood and tears. I'll also many- add to that if I could. Um, so we we do fund out of pocket, and that's been the experience uh, with Ma most of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, we are trying to get to a point where we no longer have to, and we've we've been lucky. Uh, well. Mike has has a, a story or two he'll tell later on, but uh, we've been lucky lately because people have been coming out of the woods and and recognizing Ma Filmworks and and wanting our help. So we've gone from people who are like, oh, we're making personal stuff, and and because of that, we're 
we're going to film it ourselves to, oh, hey, we're putting ourselves out there in other people's work and other people's ideas. Mm -hmm. And and we're getting cash because of it. Uh, not a ton, but uh, we're, we're starting to get that ball rolling too. So uh, Ma Filmworks is growing in different directions in order to answer that how do you get your funding question. Uh, we're, we're just, I would say that we are at the beginning of that uh that question not gotcha. quite the end yet yeah because mm -hmm. it, it, this intrigues me because i understand and like todd said uh you know uh you know hot dog and a handshake and it's kind of like the independent wrestling business you know trying to do stuff and trying to get your name out there so mm -hmm. the three of you guys now you have to buy your you know buy your equipment and stuff like that now that's not I'm sure a camera is probably a uh, price of a small car. Probably, um, they they definitely can be. The one we're working on now is, um, somewhere in the four. So and it's not even we're not even we don't even have the kit finished, but somewhere in the four thousand dollar range. Uh, our previous one was about the same. The one that we were that we had been working on, or we tried to work on, we never really got to do anything on it. Story to come later, but um, um, um yeah. Just that alone, and then let's see, our tripod by itself, we, we only have just the one tripod. Used to have several, but we only have the one right now. It's $1,000 or twelve. What's like a $1,200 tripod or something. Oh, okay. And then we, we've mm -hmm. got a dolly that was another 250 or something like that. There's a light kit sitting right here that was that was 800 bucks. I bought that on a refund back during COVID, by the way. And... Um, we, we've recently also upgraded our sound capabilities. That's one thing independent film really sucks with a lot is sound. We've upgraded our sound capabilities, and we've got, oh, geez, probably about 5,000 invested in that right now. And that's this is all just the tip of the iceberg. This is just the, the uh, jumping off point, so to speak. Wow. Just to be operational without the wow. extra frills yet. Yeah. And, and so, okay, no, the, the year that you guys all started into this company – what was one of the projects that was your first project that you, all three of you started together? The project that we all started together, definitely Howitzer Tales, the Boogeyman. Is that mm -hmm. right, Adam? Yeah, that was, that. yeah, that was the first all three of us were on. Uh, so the first one that you and I worked on would have been Vic. That was the uh, 48 hour. Yeah, that uh, would have festival. been about a year before I met Todd. Yeah, that and then... We started actually doing stuff. It was it was definitely Howitzer Tales, uh, the Boogeyman in particular, because there's there's multiple Howitzer Tales out there, multiple iterations, multiple restarts. Because it's it's a very high concept idea, and like like we say, we paid out of pocket for most of it. Uh, so it's okay. it's a hard concept to put to film when you're a indie developer. It'll be great. What? Once what someone is that says, hey, what is that someone... concept? What is that concept of the theme of of the Howitzer Tales? What is that theme? So Mike, that one's you. <laughs> so before explaining what it is now, I should go back to the beginning. Howitzer okay. Tales has been the very when we first decided to operate under Ma Studios back before we had anything, we were operating on we were working on a film called Demolition Radio. I'm not gonna go too much into this. It's not a great project. None of it survives to this day that I'm aware of. And our our second guy, the A, Andrew there, he was a part of this. And, it, and what it was back then is it was a comedy. It was a slapstick comedy. Well, he went off okay. to join the military and left Wes and I alone. And we came up with this idea that while we were waiting to continue producing that film, we would do a spinoff, so to speak, about like a prequel to that story about how Wes's character and my character met. And Wes's character's name in the story in Demolition Radio was Wesley Ann Howitzer. So... We came up with this idea that was centered around him and how he met me called Howitzer's Tales is what it was back then. Okay, and soon we soon okay. dropped the S and it just became Howitzer Tales. And back then it was a slapstick comedy about an alien invasion. I could go over scene details and stuff here that would explain exactly why, but we're not going to, I don't want to go into all that here. And we ended up sticking with that. Even after Andrew came back from the military after, after suffering an injury um, and we stuck with the Howitzer Tales concept and the first two iterations continued the comedy element, and then we started coming up with these high concept ideas and these dramatic storylines. 
to kind of coexist alongside the comedy. And as Adam will tell you, basically all the comedy is gone at this point. And Howitzer Tales now in its current iteration, which is no longer an alien invasion, it takes place in the United States several years after the fall of society now. Not a, nu- not a nuclear wasteland or anything like that. It's still just the real regular world. It's just in a state of disrepair because, uh, be- be- believe it or not, we actually predicted COVID many years before it happened with how it's her tales as part of the lore. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> so, except it was, it was Spanish flu and how it's her tales, and it wiped out about 70% of the population. And um, so everything's in disrepair. Oh, bye, Adam. Uh-oh. He'll be Uh-oh. back. Okay. <laughs> Keep, hope, yeah, keep keep going. So so, so anyway, instead of instead of the comedy, now you guys got a more serious, uh, yeah, more serious areas, more yeah, serious. So, see there he is. You guys switch sides now. Sorry I don't know where that. to look. I'll take Adam the block. So now when we when we talk about Howitzer Tales, now we first of all the character of Wesley Ann Howitzer doesn't exist anymore. The current iteration follows. Uh, a care of uh, a, a woman in her fifties named Dana Falco, who kind of can be described as, you know, when you get older and you begin to feel like you've missed your calling and you never lived up to your potential. That's Every essentially day. what this character is meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> but that's essentially what this character is meant to be is kind of that allegory for that. And because of that, we've now started cra- crafting stories not so much about the state of the world, but rather about the people and the individual stories that live within that world. So we don't focus on why the world is messed up. All we do is we focus on how these characters interact with each other in this world, which when I created this idea of having this semi-post-apocalyptic universe, I didn't do it as a love letter to any other series. I did it because I began to have a very pessimistic view of the world at the time. And so how it's her tales represented the state of the world represented the way I saw it as the world with crumbling foundations and a whole bunch of ugliness, but the people, the people are awesome. And that's what I really wanted to, that's what I really wanted to showcase in how it's her tales. And it's still, we are on yet another iteration that keeps the same basic premise now, but I've since handed the reins over to Adam down here, who's putting his own spin on it now. And he can kind of go into detail on that if he'd like to, or if you want to hold it close to your chest, but essentially, that yeah, was the project. That was the project that launched us, and it's the project that sustained us. And after 16 years or so of working on this project, or whatever, 17 years or whatever, at this point, um, I believe it's cursed now. So I gave it to Adam, and he can bear the curse for a while. I'm just kidding. But we do. Yeah. We're trying to. I'm trying to. We're trying to delegate and keep things moving now. Now that there's more of us rather than just me, or just Andrew, or you know, just Adam or whoever. Well, we lost your audio. Yeah, I do that all the time too. So, <laughs> see, I'm I'm a novice when it comes to this. But anyway, um, well, I was saying, um, 16 years and different variations. How long is the the episodes, and where are they at, or where do you put them at when you do finalize so, them? This is where it's going to get great. Um, for a very long time in the beginning, we weren't properly organized, so. A lot of our existing footage from the early years simply doesn't exist anymore. The earliest example of anything that can be found with Howitzer Tales now at this point can be found on our on our YouTube channel, which is just the Ma Film Works company or just Ma Film Works. And it's essentially it's like a memories of Howitzer Tales is what we call it. I think that's still up there. And Mm -hmm. it has a couple of clips from the earliest days, the demolition radio days in it. That's the earliest footage. And at this point, it's been processed so many times. It's all just, it looks like an 8-bit Nintendo game. It's just so downgraded. But when we came together and started reorganizing with the first series attempt at Howitzer Tales, this is actually where Todd and I ended up getting getting in good here. I met him in line down there in Pittsburgh, and Wes and I were working on a story called Howitzer Tales, The Survivalist. Um... For various reasons, the project actually died about 50% of the way through. The first 25% was able to be edited together into a proof of concept that is available on our YouTube channel to watch as Howitzer Tales, The Survivalist. Like I said, we had more of that done, but the rest of it was spread out throughout the production, so none of it really hooked together, so we just ended the story there. And Todd actually ended up coming on board. Wes and I were talking, we were like, we need a guy who looks kind of like a wild man with a little bit of scariness. And Wes had this idea of I think it was actually because you could speak German, Todd. 
we had this idea where the character would be bilingual and I was thinking about Todd because we had talked and you mentioned it, I think. And I was just like, I'm going to reach out to this guy. And I did. And it's Todd's been here ever since, basically. Hmm. <laughs> so we have that. That's the oldest current example of how it's her tales. Since then, we've actually rebooted what twice i think we've actually rebooted we rebooted we had a series of short films there were three of them that are called howitzer tales the appalachian hills and then there's subtitles after that forest of memories whatever the christmas one was called and then anarchist crash course which i apparently am the only person that likes <laughs> um that these all featured mostly the same example or the same character examples and stuff that we have today, just previous incarnations of them. They weren't really connected, but they were clearly in the same universe with the same characters and whatnot. Like different mm -hmm. episodic episodes, like, uh, I, I don't know, like, uh, say, like when The Walking Dead had those, uh, uh, not the series, but had those one episodes of yeah, like the, individuals. Yeah. So okay. the, the webisodes and stuff for The Walking yes. Dead were actually an inspiration yeah. for the Appalachian Hills. And the idea oh, okay. was is that each one was going to tackle one specific idea, whether complicated or not. And let's Forest of Memories dealt with an older character named Ben Whitehurst, who's also had multiple incarnations, he's essentially still exists, but the version of the character that appears there is now renamed as something else. Anyway, he ends up finding a picture in an abandoned structure, and the picture brings back memories of his like life before the collapse and everything where he had a daughter. He never goes into, into an explanation, but he says the word had. I had a daughter. And the whole time, we were supposed to have another person there for him to deliver the lines, lines to, but we ended up not having them show up. So he delivers the lines to a mounted wild boar head that we had. <laughs> oh, man. That we had there. And it all ended up coming together remarkably well in that one. Okay. People, people really liked that one because we pulled off that very somber, but also somehow still kind of beautiful feel to it as well in that one. And then we did the Christmas one. What was that called, Adam? Songs Without Words. Songs uh, Without Words. Yeah. So what this one was about is it was a girl who was born after the collapse with no idea as to what the original concept of Christmas was because the current the current government, if you will, of the United States at this point in time doesn't celebrate Christmas. It doesn't push Christmas. Instead, they have their own holiday called Commerce Day, which is just a whole bunch of people buying the latest gadget and whatnot, and the true meaning had been lost. So she ends up with a in a conversation with the Ben Whitehurst character about what it really meant back in the day. And it wasn't about how it wasn't about, you know, boxes and bags and the latest the latest tech and whatnot. It was people just being people, hanging out together, eating food and just enjoying each other's company. And this wow. is... Wow. Okay. So, and then we did Anarchist Crash Course, which was just kind of... Uh, every, nobody else seems to like that one. Um, that one was... Man, I don't even know what the original intent with that one was. The idea was to do, I wanted to do more of an actionized sequel for that one, so to speak. And it didn't end up happening because we didn't have the extras we needed to make it work. So all the action happens off screen and is delivered through a soundscape. But we also, I guess the main idea here would be sometimes the people you've known your whole life, they have little bits about their personality that suggest that they're not... No, they haven't always been the person you know now. In this case, it's the Ben Whitehurst character, also played by Dudley Weinreiter in all three of these instances, by the way. An amazing actor. I absolutely love hanging out with Dudley. He'll probably see this. Hi, Dudley. Anyway, um, and we see in this film, we see Ben Whitehurst is they have they, they need to get these other people out of this building next to them so they can get to safety. And these are these are, you know, what we call hijackers. It's kind of the equivalent of bandits in this universe. Gotcha. We call them hijackers because that's what they do. They wait by the side of highways and they steal vehicles with supplies in them. They're in the building next door and they need to get through them. So he uses a bunch of household chemicals there where their hold up happens to be an old abandoned drug lab. He uses a bunch of household chemicals to make a noxious gas that he tosses in there and just kills all the people. And we see Dayton Falco kind of react to this where she's realizing, oh, my God, this grandfatherly character who I've come to respect and love my whole life. He's got this dark side, man, that nobody's ever talked about where he can just do this stuff. And that was, that was, there's some person, there's some personal elements to that too, from examples in my life. I'm not going to get into them here, but that's essentially well, what we did there. Sometimes yeah. a little bit of realism probably to, uh, to a screen 
play and all the other stuff is pretty good. You know what I mean? Just a little bit of, you got to have a little bit of realism, you know? Oh, it's all, yeah. It's all got realism nowadays. To the it point reminds me, this reminds me of like, as you're telling me this, this reminds me of uh, like, I know you don't want to make like Mad Max kind of something futuristic. Uh, that was know, how what? we were, that, that was what we were going for with the, the survivalist, by the way, kind of a Mad Max and Wes Cochran. He, he was, a, he's a martial artist. And he wanted to incorporate like the whole karate, the martial art, mixed martial arts movie and stuff into there as well. Uh, it's not evident in the version that's available now because all the martial arts happened later in the film and so thus don't exist. But uh -huh. that was the original idea there was to kind of do this kind of like Mad Max in a world that wasn't completely destroyed. Gotcha. Yeah, it sounds very interesting. It's very interesting. So, so, so Todd, um, your, your concept of all this, what, what, what roles have you played on this? Um, series and have you done different characters yeah um originally i was the bad guy in the survivalist well, te technically todd they're all the same character they're just different iterations oh di different time right 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 the i can see you playing was... a bad guy i can see that <laughs> well i was against you i was the face let's just admit it can we just say that to everyone i will admit i'll i'll, I'll agree with what you say i'll Andrew agree with Moore. everything yeah <laughs> hey g <laughs> Uh, yeah, the first time around, I was the, I was toe cutter from Mad Max. Basically, I was the bad guy. Mm -hmm. uh, for the Appalachian Hills, I was a, I guess a younger version of them. Basically, it was just hoping we could all keep the family and the community together. Basically, so complete the 180. Basically, from that character, it, it was a rebooted version of the character, but he was the same character and would have progressed into the villain character over time. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So what what did you guys have uh, percolating on the stove as we speak now? Adam, this one's you. All right. All right. So um, quite frankly, I am a very different person than Mike when it comes to my writing style. Uh, Mike will write a character into the grave just because that's that's the way all of his characters end up going. Uh, he's a very dark person when he writes, and I'm, I can be, like, I can write dark, but I am more, uh, kind of more vibrant, I think, about certain aspects. So, of course, uh, my, my answer to kind of tip the scales in a different, in a different way there is uh, a show called Awesome, A Cool Name. Uh, which is a love letter slash parody to like the 1920s, 1930s golden age of cinema, uh, where you had like the the Flash Gordon uh, serials, oh, the Batman serials. I've seen serials, that. Yeah, I've seen and, that when you guys gave you know. me a link, and I did I did watch that. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I see that. Yep. Yeah. So I just started writing one day. Um, it was honestly after. Uh, How It's Your Tales, The Boogeyman. Um, I wanted something that was a little bit easier because the thing about, the thing I mentioned, I think, earlier on the stream was that I believe that How It's Your Tales is very high concept. Like, if we have a budget one day, How, How It's Your Tales will blow the roof off, you know, people's houses. They will love it. I, I can promise you that. How It's Your mm -hmm. Tales is an awesome idea. But even as I, I write iterations and, and you know, uh, restructure some of it, not all of it, most of it's just the same damn thing we did before. It's just in a longer format. Um, it, I, I have to admit that How It's Your Tales is one of those things where it's, it's just a huge scope. So I tried to write something that was a little bit smaller, a little bit easier to produce. For um, for a studio that has like one post production artist, one screenwriter slash director slash producer slash salesman, if they need me, um, you know, a, a series of actors that you know we can count on probably both hands, and then you know we we have access to other people, but it's finding people who will take us. Uh, an indie show seriously of any kind is hard. Mm -hmm. So I wanted something that could be encapsulated in a small uh, a small grouping. And when I watch when I watch those black and white serials, right, I, I 
I am completely entertained, but there might be five people on screen at most in most scenes. Um, and, and that's it. Like they, they do so much with so little and yes, it's, it's campy. It's, it's goofy. It's, it's not going to hold up by the literary standards and, and the visual standards of today's media. But what if we did that in a way where we're like, yeah, we know, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and kind of poke it's fun at ourselves as much as it, it's all just terrible is actually the tagline. Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, I'm thinking of something I have because, you know, when people like to watch movies and they like over, over, um, centralizing with a lot of, uh, titillating action, you know what I mean? You know where I'm getting yeah. with this. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and some people should not go down that road and you guys don't go down that road because it's not about, uh, it's not about the TNA kind of stuff where people would put on a film just to get blood and gore and some of that so they can get like uh, more views or people to watch it. It's more, yeah. it would compromise your principles. I can say that to all three of you guys and ask you that. Would it compromise your principles and beliefs and values in the filmmaking that you guys do? That's, um, that's a good point. Um, I would say for me, it's, it's really and truly about the point of why you do something more than just doing it. So to a point, yes. Um, if I have to put blood, guts, and gore on screen and it's going to be a part of a story, that's great. If there's, you know, TNA on, on screen, as mm -hmm. long as it has a point, as long as it's supposed to evoke some sort of emotion and not just be bluntly for views, that's, that's fine as well. But it has to be a part of the of the art. It has to be part of the story. It has to have some sort of weight to it beyond just here you go. Here here right. here you go on the silver platter. So that's that's I guess my answer for that. Okay, Michael. I would actually agree with Adam about that. Um, my view on that whole thing is we've talked about it recently, where we've talked about. Um, you know, putting together some low budget horror type films and stuff that would focus more on that kind of stuff than our traditional works. And honestly, the big reason behind all this is, is if that's the stuff that we got to do in order to actually get the funding to do the things that we really want to do, those blow your socks off films, then that's what we got to do. Okay. You know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I understand. Yeah. And that, and that kind of, and people, I don't know how they get in. I'm not into the super horror, like over campy of the blood and guts. Like I'm into horror, but the creatures and monsters of a go when I was younger, maybe, uh, maybe that I'm different than other people. So, you know, uh, Hollywood, what do you think about that? Do you think, um, you don't have to go that extreme to, to, you know, have a movie and try to get the views or do you have to, like Michael said, if it comes down to it, to get the funding for your your movies that you guys want to make you're going to have to do what something to get that done we had a discussion about this actually a couple weeks ago at a meeting we had i probably shouldn't bring that up it could cause ripples i'm just going to drop that thought right now uh i kind of i think that all forms of art even if it's like over the top extreme stuff, it, it has its merit it okay there's, there's people that live for it, you know? I mean, they don't want to go out and kill someone, but they're entertained by it because it's, you know, it's not something they would do, but to see it on the screen, that's therapeutic, I guess you could say. Right, um, right. Like, when I first started doing the acting thing, my pretty much was always, like, the heel, the henchman, all this kind of that. The past couple of roles I've done, I've been a good guy, and it's like, this is really interesting, the, the, flipping this around. And I've got so much more emotion and dialogue lately in my roles. It's like, it's, I don't know. It's maybe so. It's, it's so when you're playing a good guy, game. when you're playing a good guy, you're getting oh, yeah. more dialogue and you're getting more invested than you were playing a henchman or a bad guy in any of the roles you had before. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, interesting. I just uh, did a f thing a couple weeks ago. It's called Blood and Breakfast. It's a, it's a horror movie, but it's not like ultra gore or anything like that. I actually got to do dialogue with Nancy Ann Ritter from the Scream. She was one of the bathroom girls in the original Scream movie. Okay. It was, it, was, it was wonderful. I mean, I I surprised myself with how much emotion I put into my dialogue, my big diatribe that I had in that one scene with her. So, look out for that, please. Well, and and you have to 
because you've had a lot of uh, uh, bit roles in some major movies. So how does how do you let's get to that a little bit real quick? How do you go out and try to get to be on the screen on anything you can do with just taking any type of role, or do they expand, or how do they do that? When I the first the the first on screen thing I ever did that actually was on a big theater screen was a movie called Shriek Show, and the the script for it actually changed halfway through my association with the movie. Um, my character completely changed um, during the movie. But, you're, you're, you're completely no, no, changed. Just, no, no, I had this. I had the script for the original version of it. And I had to memorize everything, and suddenly I said. Here's the new version of it. It's a totally different character. Totally oh different no! Version. It's okay. I mean, it worked out. I mean, I'm pleased with how it worked. And uh, what was I talking about? I got you off the table. I'm sorry. I got you off the train. Shriek <laughs> show about about trying to get it's roles so... and and how you know yeah, uh, lately, small roles can lead to bigger roles. Because of that, I made friends that introduced me to other friends who introduced me to other friends, and now it's there's really this big community. Here on the East Coast, uh, people in Maryland and Baltimore and West Virginia and Virginia and so forth. A lot of my roles, I don't even get uh, audition for them. Where they said, "Hey, Todd, you're good for this. Will you do this?" And that's how it's been with a lot of my roles lately. Just because they know I can do it, I can do dialogue, I can do emotion, I can act, I can do action. So, it's nice. community work is great around here. And uh, I know you got me one time. You got me a, a gig on that outsiders and they, and they canceled the, the, my part, but Hey, oh. it was, no, it was okay. But I mean, I was, I know how they, you know, they did it and it was just, uh, they filmed the scene over and over all day long and they cut my role of being a, a, yeah. a drunk in a bar, but it, it happens. And that's, that's yeah. the stuff that you have. So most of the time you're not getting cut in your roles. You're actually going to these roles and they don't <laughs> cut you. They're going to use you. Unlike they did to me when I was an extra, but you're more than just an extra. You're getting uh, uh, speaking roles, yeah. and how how does that work? When you you, you got your uh, you got your actor's uh, card? I'm not. A, well, that's that's a frustrating thing about this the oh, SAG card. Okay. To to get SAG, you have to have three principal or three you know, principal roles, premier roles, or whatever you want to call it. I was asked to come do a couple days on House of Cards as a uh, stand-in for someone, which is considered. A principal role, basically, you're standing in one of the characters, and it, and it has to be a union signatory project too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Which, oh, uh, which okay. That was, which of course that was. I got down there, and I'm, it was like it was going to be two days, so I was going to be like two thirds of the way to SAG, basically. I get uh -huh. down there. Oh, we just want you to be an extra. Oh, why? I wouldn't have come down here if I've just known this. <laughs> so it's a gamble where you you just got to show up, and then hopefully it's it's more lucrative than you know, and hopefully they don't. They don't give you another role where you're, you didn't want that one, yeah. but you have to have three, three parts in a major union studio project to get your card. Well, and the other thing about House of Cards was they uh, contacted me, asked me if I wanted to be a uh, lawyer for Kevin Spacey's character, the, the president. What was his name? Uh, anybody remember what his name was on that show? No, but I in the show. Yeah, I mean it was House a good show till till Kevin went off the, till they yeah. canceled him and did whatever they did, but. Um, so that would have been a, a speaking role, and that would have gave you one closer to the door. Yeah. Oh. Well, I, and also the thing that can happen on these sets is if they like you and they'll give you a speaking role, you'll get your card right then and there. Because uh, I did uh, Promised Land with uh, Matt Damon and uh, John Krasinski and so forth. There was a girl who played a waitress on that who they gave her a role, and she got her card right then and there. But they cut their scene out of the thumbnail, so. But she still got her card, she, though, right? She got the card. Yes, exactly. Oh, so that's what you're vying for to get that card, because you've been how, now. How long have you been acting since you started to uh, till now? How, how long has it been? Uh, Dark Knight Rises was the first thing. That was 2011. So that's what uh, 13 years. Okay, and you were in also. You were in, um, I believe, you were also in Captain America. Oh, we had to break. No, what? I, what? I went up. I went up to Cleveland in the dead of winter for Captain America: The Winter Soldier. Stood out in line for four hours, 
I got in there. Oh. I still up my, they took my picture. They fill up my paperwork and everything. Never heard from them. Oh, I'm sorry. I see. I did oh. tell people that you were in it too. I'm well. He's oh. still in it, people. He's in there. He's in the scene <laughs> somewhere. I, I did tell people because I know you did. Yeah. I, I know you did uh, the Dark Knight, and I know you did. Yeah. You were uh, the Outsiders. You were a cousin or something yeah. like that. You played. Yeah. That was your. That was probably your major. I, I major played Campbell role. Farrell. <laughs> that was probably the major role that you ever had so far. Now. For big budget, that was the most I did basically. Okay. Uh, with this with this indie stuff, I'm you know principal all the time now you know, with speaking roles and character, and then you just check on the IMD for DDB for everything I've done. You know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so but what, you're getting this you're about this close, and then once you get this close, and you're you got I, your card. I hope so. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And you're more of a character actor. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because you can do that means to me a character you can do a whole bunch of stuff, so you can do anything. Hell. Yeah. What is the was what say. was what was the hardest role that you ever did in anything you've done? Hmm. Let's see. I get, I did a movie called uh, Killed on Arrival that's still in the post production right now, but that's the first one where I actually had to show emotion and show that i'm a real person and everything and i got a lot of dialogue and that thing so it was remembering dialogue for the first that much dialogue for the first time is stressful but it, it worked out pretty well and i hope that one sees the light of day because it's it, it was a good project okay yeah. yeah you'll have to let me know when it comes out so i can share it and watch it because i uh yeah so that was so do you have anything coming up together you guys right? Do you guys all, you guys, and I'm probably getting, I don't want to get off tan, tangent here. You guys all together, what is your next uh, project that you guys got the, you have Adam already have it written, you know, Todd's ready to act in a role and M Michael, you're ready to direct it like something soon in the spring or summer of this year, you guys are ready to rock and roll with something. Um, awesome. Cool name. We're ready to film that immediately. Honestly. That's yeah. the that's the biggest one right now. And my my involvement with Awesome the Cool Name is a little more minimized as Adam's actually the director on that and I'm handling some things behind the scenes. Todd, you're not in Awesome the Cool Name, are you? Well it's funny because no, he know, is. Oh he is? One time you guys it's up told the me air. let's wanted... put it that way. Well, one time you guys told me that you had a something in mind for like three characters or like three bumbling henchmen, like three stooges kind of thing, and you wanted me, someone yep. else, and Mick Foley. They wanted to ask him if he'd be in it. <laughs> oh yeah, great to bounce the dialogue off Mick Foley. I, so I've I've got this vision right uh, for okay. for a skit. You know, you've got uh, Dink and Donk, uh, who are uh, a mercenary duo, and then um, Mick Foley's character. So uh, they're they've got the the good guys cornered, and there's this one person who always dies in every single episode, played by the same person playing different people. And uh, so I always had this idea of uh, McFoley coming out and he's got the finger guns, you know, bang, bang. <laughs> they work. <laughs> the guy goes down, you know, stone cold dead. Uh -huh. And, and it, you just got that moment of, you know, just, just trying to figure out the semantics of what just happened. And uh, it, it, the, the scene in my head ends with McFoley being as confused as anyone. He's just like, bang, and, and then he drops <laughs> over, you know. <laughs> okay, okay. You trying to get a contact with him, though? Have you ever tried? Um, I've, I've got uh, IMDb Pro. I've got all the, the uh, contact information. Um, I, I do things one step at a time when it comes gotcha. to it. Uh, that's like a future episode type of deal. That's, you know, oh, hey, we've got funding. We've got, you know public interest so i have not reached out yet but that's you want to have all the cards the... on the table everything yes. all lined up before you okay before you try yeah to i i don't okay. go after the superstars until you know i've got something to show for it <laughs> okay okay so i was watching on on the, your the channel that you guys showed me and you guys had i believe it was a 12 minute clip of Danny Rand as Iron Fist. Could you? Oh, that was 
Yeah, that was that was actually Wes Cochran. That was produced as a that was the last thing we ever uh, Wes and I ever did together. Um, that was okay. produced as an audition essentially for Netflix's Iron Fist at the time. And oh, Danny okay. Rand, I think it was Danny Rand or somebody got the role. Was it Danny Rand? I yeah. Well, it was yeah. I mean, it was black and white, and it was like in a cabin. Yeah. Or- well, no, I mean, like, whoever got the role in the actual show got the role while we were in the middle of producing this. Or whatever. oh, the guy so from decided, uh, Game of the guy at Game of Thrones. Guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we decided we decided we were just gonna finish it and put it out there. I thought it was good. Yeah, I thought was it was fun. very interesting. It was a yeah. lot of fun that project. Yeah, and he his fighting scenes were very good, and I was like, wow. And you guys didn't you can you get in trouble for that or do anything like that or. Is it copyrighted because um, it's Iron Fist. I don't want to. I mean, if any, if Marvel's listening to my podcast, then God bless America or Disney. Uh, <laughs> God bless America. But um, no. Um, no? So I'm, 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 yeah, don't I mean, that. don't answer that. I don't. I don't really think so. If we were going to get in trouble for it, we would have because it was okay. actually produced. It was produced with the intention. And with contact, we had contact with, uh, I don't, this was Dave Clark that had all this set up. We'd mentioned him in the past mm-hmm. in this show. And um, he had had something set up with a contact from the production for this video. Okay. So I, I, I was under the impression, I still am, that we had blessings for it. And okay, we've never had any issues with it on YouTube or anything like okay. that. No, I thought it was great. So I thought it was good. I, I, I'm a big Marvel guy. I, I mean, I thought it was cool. And I was like, oh, wow. So, okay. It was good. Now that guy has um, the guy who was in the uh, scene. He does acting too. Is he? Does he still um, with you guys sometimes or no? No. This is a complicated story that I'd rather oh. not get into a whole gotcha. lot of details right now. Gotcha. But yeah, he's he's not. He's not <laughs> okay. Involved. Okay, anymore. I understand. I have I, I I have people like that in my life too. Yep, I, I, I agree. But it was it was okay. And you directed that, Michael. No, Dave, well, sort of. Dave Clark actually directed that, but it was his direct, direct. It was his, in his like inaugural directorial, uh, directorial gotcha. debut. That's what I'm looking for. Gotcha, so gotcha, I gotcha. kind of co-directed a little bit of it, and Wes kind of co-directed a little bit of it. But we all had the same creative vision, so it wasn't really an example of too many cooks in the kitchen. We all knew what we were doing. Okay, you sprinkle so. a little bit of. Uh... Some little bit of uh, pepper and paprika, and yeah, a little I bit will and say, if it hadn't have been for my input, it wouldn't have even been an Iron Fist thing because Dave Clark had a fundamental misunderstanding of what the character's comic book abilities are, and he thought that he could shoot fireballs out of his fist, which is what he was going to do to ignite the fire in the fireplace. And I was like, no, it's like it's like a, it's just an effect for the the concentrated like energy or whatever. Well, it's well not. God bless you for that. Yes, it, that's not yes. No, nope, yeah. he couldn't do that. So. Okay, so you guys are lo- looking at something here very, very soon to film. And yep. what yeah, the, yep. what's the what's the premises about that? One more time, or a little bit of awesome, little... cool name. Um, it's uh, black and white uh, love okay. letter slash parody to the the old Flash Gordon days and and all those old films. Um, so it's like a it... serial. So you'll do a couple. We're thinking about it. Uh, this first one ends in a way where it could be comically, it could be comic just to let it end uh, okay. because the, the old serials, you know, they always showed the uh, the hero dying or they showed something that alluded to him dying. And then the other one would pick up with a, oh, no, wait, <laughs> gotcha, <laughs> you know, and it yeah. just continue on. So we we want to keep going in that style either as multiple episodes or just let the guy die, you know, <laughs> you know, okay. maybe he just doesn't make it. Um, so, uh, so anything else, anything else after that one, do you guys have something that's like on the back burner until you guys complete this stuff to so all three of you guys start we, doing something else? We do. Yeah. So Adam down there, I've, I've, I've sort of assigned him the role of kind of reimagining how it's her tales to yeah. kind of fit the story that he had originally intended on starting with the boogeyman. And then I took it off on a feature film tangent that uh, I, I like, I got, it, it, I just got so burnt out on, I had to, I had to step away and um, on developing. And he's got that. That'll be our next series after awesome McCool name. Okay. But we do have a yep. feature film. It's in development at the moment called American Venom. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on it right now because the script is ever changing. It's essentially a critical look on the way society deals with um, society and 
uh, it's a critical look at how the media can cause society to get all up in an uproar and like, oh what, what, what about the lives that are destroyed in the process and stuff okay and that's, and that's gonna be a feature that will be a feature film okay and when you guys do feature films where do you guys actually do your like uh say your premieres and stuff at um because I know my one buddy, when he used to do it, we, he used to do it at the local uh, movie theater. At, he rented out a hotel um, convention thing, and he had that. When I when I played a couple roles in the Wild Boar films, when ta- uh, Troy Fritz was uh, doing his stuff, which he does no longer, which he did stuff. Um, he did horror stuff, but no, um, no uh, over to tra- uh, no X rate, no skin. You know, it was like, yeah. and that's what always was his. He wasn't going to conform, and I, I give him props for that. So you guys don't do the same thing until you guys, if someone's going to give you $50,000 and say, hey, Michael, Adam, Todd, here it is. Here's $50,000. Go do something. Then that would be the way that you would actually make one of those kind of movies before you guys got yeah. that big money. Yeah. Yep. I don't blame uh, you. We have I don't to go blame step you. by step. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, if you don't, if you jump the gun, I mean, taking risks is not – a terrible thing but if you take risks and fail someone is going to have at least hurt feelings if not mm-hmm. you know you're going to have someone asking for money you don't have anymore or yeah. you know lots of things can go wrong lots of legal troubles can can occur so okay. it's best if we uh, kind of measure where we are realistically um, I will also say that Mike has been working with a, a talented director named Aaron Dunbar. Uh, not all that Ma does is just very, for very good guy. Very, and I know Aaron. Very oh, you know guy. Aaron? Oh, yes, I do. He's yes. great. He's great. Yes. Uh, we haven't even gotten to the part where we talk about what happened to Mike's trailer yet, but uh, Aaron, Aaron is the reason why Ma is per- uh, positioned so well. Uh, because when when we were kind of down and out in July, um, Aaron Aaron needed help on a, a film of his. He does the Christian films and stuff yes, like he does. that. Yes, and uh, he he made sure to take care of Mike very very well during that. So um, it's not my position to talk about it. Mike, if you want to talk about it, uh, that's another thing that Ma does, though, is is Christian films through. Uh, and I, and Aaron I've seen Dunbar. Aaron's stuff. I, I've watched Aaron's stuff. It's very, very good. I just saw him when I was talking to you guys before, before when we met that first time when we were uh, typing and stuff. Um, he was doing stuff at Staples, getting posters made, and I was actually getting mm-hmm. stuff made for the wrestling stuff. And I've known Aaron, oh my God, over 20 some years um nice he was, yeah when he used to be into the restaurant and the bar industry way way okay. back when but yes that, that uh, he's that, awesome that, yeah that movie that i saw with the um the, the religious one about the uh the indian stuff and he, he mm. was on tubi i i thought it was real good i thought it was great um so yeah that that's cool so yeah that's so you guys gave him a, uh you helped him out or he helped you guys out and you guys are networking and you guys through that met aaron yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, Aaron, Aaron lives I've, like half hour away from me, I think. Maybe 20 minutes. Nice. Yes. Yeah, I've known Aaron for uh, a number of years through an organization that I'm the vice president of, the Northern Appalachian Film Collective, um, which is essentially just a society of filmmakers and uh, other, other, other artists. artists honestly, other yeah. artists, other artists, mostly at this point. There's only a couple of us that are still filmmakers. But um, yeah, I've known him for a number of years through that organization, mm-hmm. and he is uh, one of his cast members on his new film, Judge Not, um, that'll be coming, that's uh, premiering uh, here in May, reached out to me just, it would have been, what, like two months before July, so uh, May, May of 2023, and, he's, and she said, hey, we're looking for somebody to run sound on the uh, feature film, you should reach out for it. And um, I did. I reached out and I, I threw him a quote, and he apparently liked the quote, and he hired me. And nice. yeah, that was that was great. We had an ironclad contract track and everything, which is ultimately the thing that saved Ma was my contract. I'm the one who wrote it, <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, 
yeah, then two months later, we had a catastrophic structure fire that destroyed everything, everything of Ma. Oh, the building, no. my house, my car, every piece of equipment we had, except for this light kit here, which survived because it's in a, it's in a fire-resistant container. And it also, because it's in a fire-resistant container, it also saved the tripod and the shoulder rig. So... Mm -hmm. We lost, yeah, we lost all of that, everything, including the entire sound department that we had been contracted to the film to, oh, to, 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 to use. And I sent him a message while my, while my house was burning in front of me, I sent him a message saying, Hey, uh, got a bit of a problem. My house is burning down. I'm still good for the production though. And he was like, you're good. And I'm like, yeah, I'm good. And, um, Oh my God. Yeah, so uh, my aunt, actually, who's Tammy Farnsworth, the other member of Ma here, actually funded us completely. Re we ended up rebuilding the sound department completely within a couple of weeks after that, just to show that we were still good for it. And if we hadn't have done that, we wouldn't be in a position. We, if, we, if we had gotten out of that contract, I don't think we'd have actually been able to bounce back the way we have. No. Because it's been a combination of tammy's funding aaron working with us and going above and beyond uh, i hope you mm -hmm. see this aaron love working with you can't wait to work on the next oh he's one. on my he's on my social media yeah all right, I mean, yeah it'll... yeah and if it hadn't have been for him and then also the fact that all of this adam will attest to this too that there was a time yeah. period where i was very complacent um where i would just sort of sit there and wait for things to happen and they didn't and then the right. fire happened and for a little while that still continued afterwards because let's face it i was down in the dumps i'd lost my home i lost my car i lost 33 years of my life i lost my dog um all of oh it i did not lose the shirt that i was wearing during the fire which i'm currently wearing right now <laughs> so i didn't lose that so i didn't lose the shirt off my back luckily so i was down in the dumps for a little bit and then I got into this apartment that I'm in right now, and um, the music conservatory here at Warren has been very instrumental. They, I, I have a job there. I teach a film program now here, uh, the Warren County Youth Network, which is essentially like a news network, but it's for like 12-year-olds. It's run by 12-year-olds, too. I teach the program here. I live here. Everything's great now. I've got myself set back up, and then something clicked in me one day where... I wasn't going to be, I didn't feel, I, the complacency was gone. Whoever that version of me was died a couple of months after the fire in this new me, this, this new me that has like the, that, that, forgive the pun, that fire burning in his eyes right now. That's just out here doing things and making things happen. So it's definitely been a combination of things between me actually getting okay. off my ass, so to speak, Tammy helping to fund things. And then people like Aaron being there to actually prop us up whenever we're, whenever whenever we've needed it whenever we've needed well, help so well i mean that's mm -hmm. that's a, a, a man that's a cat catastrophic but it seems like you rose up from the ashes like a phoenix and maybe due to the fact that maybe and i always believe in karma somewhat but you guys were helping him do a religious film and maybe due to that got you guys back on track you know what I mean? Just because yeah. of just the, the aura of, of that feel good kind of situation where that those movies are a feel good kind of movie. I, you know, I've watched a lot of movies in my time and I'm not, I don't want to blow smoke. I don't blow smoke up anybody's whatever, but I did watch it. And I spent an afternoon watching Aaron stuff and I told him when I saw him and I wrote to him and said it was a very good movie. And it was something that everybody should probably sit back and see those kind of movies those those movies based on the higher power is there's nothing wrong with that you know oh, i agree so. yeah there's nothing wrong with that i know i alluded to earlier about us doing the low budget horror stuff just to keep making oh happen. i understand that too, yeah no I, I i i adore those kind of films i absolutely yeah. do i don't live for them but i'm just saying they're not the things we want to do but you know what i'm right. saying it all it all comes together there's pieces that fit together here right and I so mean, far they've been fitting together remarkably well that's 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 awesome i mean out of like, that We've you know. managed to come back from from this fire. Ma Filmworks is now standing on much more stable ground than it ever was beforehand, and we thought we were good before. <laughs> oh, so it's so. more rock solid. Rock yeah, solid. Yeah, def definitely, okay. yeah, at this point. So yeah. I know I got off the beaten path, but I wanted to ask you, Todd, what role do you have on this upcoming uh, feature film that you guys are going to be doing? For Awesome and Cool Name? No, yes. American no, Venom. The American Venom one. I don't know yet, Mike. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh -oh. Uh, we're, yeah, so we're, we're, still, we're still somewhat early in development. 
We have a complete. <laughs> So we have a complete story, and we have a mostly complete script. I am still kind of hung up a little bit on the order of things and how things need to proceed to not be absolutely boring in the middle of the film. But apart the from that, I'm going there. to... Potatoes are cooked, but uh, oh my. the stew is still cold, essentially. Yeah, yeah. So it's, a musical it's, number. It's, it's, yeah, it's getting there. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely getting there, and when the time comes, I mean, it's going to be all hands on deck for this, in addition to all hands on other mm. people's decks, because it's not going to be something we're going to be able to fully pull off on our own. Got we're going to need we're going to need gotcha. contractors and whatnot. Um, Todd might find himself with a with with a speaking role. I'm considering in that one that I have just now revealing to him just now, and so. Well, I told actually I, Adam and I talked about this at that meeting. I said. Uh, it doesn't have to be an acting role. I'll hold the microphone for you. I'll do sound. Yeah, you might have whatever, to do that whatever too. Whatever needs done is what I'll do. You know, I've got back problems and can't hold the microphone without causing harm to myself. So there you go. So yeah, the so. great part of the indies, you can act and do three other jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you probably got to do seven. As someone putting you together want. a wrestling promotion, I'm sure you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, more than others. Yes, it's the, same. the 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 filmmaking is just like uh, independent wrestling or a small company. Mm -hmm. You got uh, different hats for different things, and it, it's yep. so you guys. It's a, I, and I've learned I learned a lot more just talking to all three of you guys today in this in depth stuff about filmmaking and the film studio and stuff like that. I mean, it's it's a lot of a lot of work. I'm sure it's a lot of 24 7 days seven days a week every day am i not right uh yeah it, that's, it what, that's, what it, that's what it feels like right now not right this <laughs> second this feels nice and relaxed right now but basically you know up until i completed we completed a special effects job for aaron's film and uh yeah up until i completed that i was kind of like man i'm going to sleep and having nightmares about filmmaking now great <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I still do, but now they're not, you know, now it's like I don't hold it. It's like I've got some free well, time to actually exist now. <laughs> I know all three of you love this profession and love this, but let me ask you one more question before I get into these other questions that uh, I want to, you know, off the can. M Michael, if you didn't have the passion, I'm going to ask you guys the same question so you guys can think of your answers. If you didn't have, if you lost your passion for filmmaking and all that stuff, do you ever see that happening in your life, though? To a point, and it has happened. But here's the thing: oh, even when yeah. I lose my passion, there's still nothing else I'd rather be doing. If that makes okay. sense. That and, makes and, sense. And and I'll say the same thing when it comes to hard days on set. I mean, on Aaron Dunbar's set, we had a day that was well over a hundred degrees in the filming location, and it was through no fault of his own. Just the air conditioning in the location wasn't working. And even on days like that, where it's like I had like a minor heat stroke with like the I wasn't sweating, but I was cold and it was also well over 100 degrees, that feeling. Mm -hmm. And even on days like that, there's still nothing I'd rather be doing than this. And, you know, then not just even being on, on a film set, but the writing part of it, too, the getting the crew together, being on podcasts like this one. Oh, there's no, Yeah, this 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 is what I was. This is what this is what I was made for. Okay. So that's a good answer. I mean, yes, no matter what happens, if you're down, you're never out. I like that. Todd, what about you? I always want to do this, but so, interesting thing. I told you about the talking to GMO. I did a show for GMO up in Cleveland just before COVID happened. And he offered, he wanted me to bring me back for more. And I'm like, holy crap, can I do this again? After all, it was like 20 years since I'd last been in the ring. <laughs> And then COVID happened, and uh, my uh, my wife's father was living with us, and he's he was elderly. Uh -huh. And when COVID happened, I didn't want to go up there and catch something and bring it to him because he would have done, you know. Right, I understand. I understand. He, he's, he, I mean, he's gone now, for unfortunately. But um, I I could see myself doing that because I still have the passive of getting in that ring again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm hmm. over 50, but... It, it was a rush doing that again after all that time. We did a hardcore match with uh, me and me and I can't remember who my tag team partner was, but it was against him and Psycho Mike. Oh my gosh! What a treat it was to work with Psycho Mike. I'll oh tell you my. that. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, so you would still, no matter what, 
the passion for you and the fire is always burning. Always. always. Gotcha. Okay. That, I, that's good to, yeah. I mean, cause everybody, sometimes people just, and lately the world is kind of crazy and it's the hobbies, the hobbies that turn into more hobby, you know what I mean? Turn to professions and people strive on that. That's what I, I mean, I try to do that, but it's, it's so hard because my job is kind of crazy, but I do stuff like this. You know, I, I don't, I'm not looking to make money. I'm just looking to do stuff I like and that's it. So, but maybe one day it happens. So Adam, how about you? Um, you know, it's, that's a great question because it's, um, it's not a defined answer for me. So okay. here's what, here's what I think I will say. Um, I wish that success was a little more secure. You know, if success yeah. was a little more secure, I could tell you in six months time, I'll be making X and stuff like that. I didn't get into this business for the money, but I've gotten so ingrained into the writing, into the directing. This is what I'm good at. These are my skills. This is Adam Rista at 36 that um, I now need success in this business because this is where my skills lie. This is where I'm going to thrive. Um, sometimes I do wish that I had branched out more. Sometimes I do wish that I was better at say sales or, or accounting or, you know, just, just other things, any things. Mm -hmm. But, um, I will say that when the going gets good in, in this job, when, when I'm on set, when I'm with the, the actors that I also call friends, when I'm, you know, uh, setting the scenes when I'm writing and it's just me and it's, it's wrong side here. And there we go. When it's, when it's all up here, you know, there's an entire universe up here. There's, there's characters and there's act structures. And I, I get to experience all of this, whether the, re whether the rest of the universe gets to see it or not. Uh, and it's, it's so cool to do it. I will say though, it's tough. And anyone going into it needs to know that it's tough to find the kind of success where you have both success and security. And that's something that I wish was much, much more verbose in what we do, uh, because that's, that is frustrating. I won't ever say that I would lose my passion for this. I will say that, you know, there are other jobs that I've made more money on, mm -hmm. but I do this because I love it. I do this because I love the stories that we create and, and the people that I've met have been phenomenal. And I want to do this, not only for my own success, I want to do it for Todd's. I want to do it for Mike's. I want to do it for Aaron's and, and all the people we will work with and all the people I have yet to meet, you know? I like that. I like that team Avenger type concept right there. That's exactly. No, I mean, exactly. yeah, we've, 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 we've kind of compared it to something like that from time to time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's good to have a strong, strong staff because if you have strong staff, um, you can tackle anything. And I, and I believe that in my own stuff with my staff that I just got to, uh, you know, in the core with, and sometimes I was doing stuff by myself and it's very, very hard. So I, I mean, mm -hmm. I commend all, I commend all three of you guys because the film industry, I have friends of mine have done it and spent a lot of money and, you know, they, they got a couple of their movies out and it's, you know, they were on Amazon and stuff, you know, and it's, it takes a lot of work doing it and, mm -hmm. and scenes and hiring people and having people like uh, Mike said, when you were doing a show and the one person didn't show up, I've, I've, I've been around where that happens too. And you got to so change your role. Yeah. So that's, I mean, you got to think on the fly and you got to, you know, do whatever. And, and I, I think I did this one movie where the whole second part of the movie was just ad lib because the whole thing was just, I did, I pretend I was Charlton Heston blowing up, uh, the, blowing up the planet like he did in, in beneath the planet of the apes. I, I, just, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it was, it was, yeah, I mean, Earth it was a dead world. Yeah. So I, I, I just, and I sound like a surfer dude. Cause my, my lines were, there was no lines. So, I mean, things do happen in this business, but you guys, um, you know, I got a little bit more, um, aspects of how it's run and how it's done and, 
And I, I, I commend all three of you guys for doing it. And I know Todd's been, you know, doing his acting stuff for a long, long time. And, and I know that's not easy. And, uh, you know, you, every time you post stuff on your Facebook, you're promoting it and stuff. And I commend you for that, Todd. Um, you know, you've been on ID TV, you've been in, I mean, you were playing a cop. I mean, I, I remember some of the stuff that you've done, so it's, you know, it's awesome. I, I now is 2024 is where you get that card. I, I didn't know it was that hard to get that card. I did not know that. So wear some wood around here. I mean, knock. <laughs> well, well, I, I you know, hard work, just perseverance. But anyway, I got a couple questions for you guys. It's like off the wall, kind of funny. But it's going to be based on movie stuff because you guys are all in the movie and uh, movie industry. Uh, Michael, I'm going to start with you. Your favorite movie of all time. <laughs> oh, this 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 one's pretty easy. Uh, it's definitely Jurassic Park, the first okay. one. Okay, <laughs> okay, that was what made it all happen in your world. It was yes. There okay. are a couple of strong contenders that might be tied with it, but that one I think is going to edge it out. Okay, okay, Todd. <laughs> For the longest time, it was the original Evil Dead with Bruce Campbell. Okay. But then Avengers Endgame happened. I've, Marvel has owned me since I was a child, basically, and that okay. was such a roller coaster ride. It was a, to me, it was the perfect movie. Mm -hmm. But now they're they need a lot of help. They I need, think Daredevil's going to help. They need some writers. They need some writers like what Ma Good Filmworks team. has got. Can you guys can you guys apply for that stuff? No, I'm just being facetious. Well, maybe. No, I, I, hey. Hey, if we I can get that contract, that would solve a lot of problems. Apply. <laughs> we can apply generally to work with larger studios. They they put us on whatever and, and tell us what to write, though. True, true. Oh, you don't have any of your creative expertise and they won't let you, they won't let you yeah. make the character. Oh, yeah, not until gotcha. you've got some yep. clout. Okay. Anyway, I'm okay. sorry. I, de I derailed it. I do this, so go, go ahead. Just ignore me. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Adam, your favorite movie of all time. If I had to pick one, uh, and I will say I'm one of those people who likes just about anything because of this, that, and your, or the other thing. Mm -hmm. um, but if I had to pick one, I'd say Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. Oh, that's a good movie. That is a good movie. Mm. No one's ever, no one's, I don't, no one's ever put that in their top. Wow. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. I saw that. I went to the movie theater to see that. It was good. That was really uh, good. I just, just was barely, barely too young for that one. Oh, I got uh, Generations though. I did, I okay. did get to see Generations on in, in the theater. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a Star Wars guy. <laughs> But I do like Star Trek, though. I do. I mean, but I'm, yeah. So, okay. Michael, your favorite actor of all time. My favorite actor of all time. Brendan Gleeson. Uh, he played Bad Mad-Eye Moody in Harry Potter. He played, he was in uh, in Bruges. Okay. Um, basically, so the thing is, I only know him from a couple of things. 28 Days Later, he was in 28 Days Later. Gotcha. I only know him from a couple of things, but there's something about every character that he's ever played, including Mad Eye Moody, by the way, which is a very out there character, that I have just looked at and been like, "There's something about this guy that sells whatever he's in." And I don't know whether it's just the fatherly nature of him as an actor. John Goodman does the uh, does the same thing, but I, I, Brendan Gleeson does it for me a little bit more. Okay, Todd, I'm sitting here thinking about this. Um... I'd probably have to go with uh, the legend, Mr. Clint Eastwood. I've, I've, and, and as a director, he's, my God, he's a good director. Yeah, I can. Yes, he is. I would agree with that. Yeah. When, when I was filming a, a Promised Land down around Pittsburgh, he was down around there uh, to do some uh, site searching for locations and so forth. And I was, please let me work with him, please. But he never actually filmed down oh. here. That was kind of a bummer, but love his movies, though. Okay. Yeah, somebody said the other day that uh, the, they didn't understand the outlaw Josie Wells, and I told them that uh, you, you better just stay home and never watch TV or movies again. But that was <laughs> so. Yeah, that's good. I like I liked your pick, Adam. Um. So there's this one, uh, Todd Bobbinreath. He's pretty cool. <laughs> also known as Johnny Tambo. Uh. No. I, so 
I I don't really have a favorite actor. I think it's because I pick people uh, based on their personalities. And with actors, you only get the the Hollywood glare. Oh. But uh, if I had to pick one, it'd be it'd be Todd, it'd be Dudley, it'd be Kaylee Santel, it'd be Jen De Blasio, it'd be all the people that I've gotten to work with who I absolutely adore. So that's my honest and true answer. No matter how sappy it sounds. <laughs> okay, well, you, well, that means you answered the, the your favorite actors too. So the, the people that you included would be your favorite actors. So I'll go with you, Todd, your favorite actress of all time. Ooh, favorite actress of all time. Um, let me let me think on this for a second. Mike, you want to go ahead while I think about this? Uh, for a ahead, Mike. No, because I need to think about it. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I um, I have. I have one more. The, 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 I'm going to go with you, Adam, and then I'll, I'll go around. You're the greatest, okay. the greatest character in movies ever. Oh, <laughs> um, that's a big one. Um, greatest one person, character. The in... one person, the one character that they played, the one person, uh, whatever that made you like. Oh my God, it's the greatest. Uh, greatest character role ever of all time. D. Forrest Kelly, uh, for me, for me personally, when it came to uh, inspirations, it was D. So Forrest it'd be, Kelly. It'd be, it'd be Dr. McCoy. Dr. McCoy, Everything. Star Trek. Okay. Yep. Wow. Okay. Yep. Okay. You guys get a female actor, actress yet? I, I do, yes. Okay. Go ahead, Michael. Talia Shire. She played Adrian, Rocky's wife mm -hmm. in the Rocky movies. Okay. She also she also played Connie Corleone in the Godfather movies. And I really like the way she was able to pull off those two vastly different characters, especially with the Corleone character, where she just there's there's a there's a very the per, who she starts as in those films and who she ends as is mm -hmm. there's a lot there's a lot of depth there, and it's the same mm -hmm. with the Rocky movies too. Although less so because she's still she's she plays that like meek housewife type character in those movies and she does that well, but it's like that in opposition to who she was in The Godfather. Gotcha. Good, good one. Todd, your favorite actress. I'm gonna go with uh, Judy Dench. I think she's such an intense, wonderful actress. Uh, actor. I'm sorry, not supposed to very competent actor. Everything she does is just phenomenal. I mean, even like James Bond, she's what uh, the evil queen of numbers. Okay. Wonderful acting with her, absolutely. Nice. But okay. really quickly, one thing he mentioned, Talia Shire. I have a quick story for you. Okay. I I got to do uh, both Creed one and two, and uh, of course Stallone was there on set every day. Basically, that we were there. The best thing, as I'm, I still get goosebumps talking about this, because thinking about this, the second day I was on set of the original Creed, uh, some new extras came in that day. And they were up there talking about the scenes in the ring. And uh, some of the extras go, yo, Rock, we love you, Rock. Stallone grabs the house mic. First he goes, yo, Adrian. And everyone's like, woo. Then he proceeds to do the entire speech from Rocky Balboa. So how many times you get knocked down? How many times you get back up and keep moving forward? That's how winning's love done. Love that speech. All of, us, all of a sudden, all of us in Philadelphia, in a boxing ring, with Stallone in the ring as Rocky, stood up as one chanting, Rocky, Rocky. It was it was a perfect moment. That is a hell of a story. That is good, <laughs> and that that speech is actually inspirational when he does it on the street with his kid in that movie. Anyway, mm -hmm. I mean, yep. you can't. Yeah. Okay. So. Oh, actor. What's best character? Are you were saying what character? I'm gonna go with Joker. Ooh. The past two Jokers, one well, except for what's his name from uh, Suicide Squad, but hey, he that, was he was great in Zack Snyder's Justice League for ten seconds. Yeah, that's true. You, you can shut him off now. What's your, what's your best? <laughs> what, who's your best? Who's your best Joker though? Uh I'm gonna go with Heath Ledger. Mm. He was just okay. insanely intense. Okay, because I know Jack Nicholson and, and Heath. It was two different type Jokers. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. but uh, both of them were both iconic roles. So, okay. And Joaquin, Joaquin Phoenix also. Yes. I never saw that yet. I have not, I have yet to see that yet, which is surprising because I'm a big comic book guy and I haven't got a chance because I'm so, so busy sometimes. Michael? So, who's my favorite character? Yeah, who's your favorite character? 
Uh, definitely Michael Corleone from the Godfather movies. Okay. Not because, you know, not because of my name, but because, you know, much like I was just talking about with Talia Shire there, the character development that progresses between all three of those movies, and say what you will about the third movie, wasn't great. It was fun. Sometimes. But the character depth for him was still very much there. Where there's you have this character who doesn't want to be a part of whatever he is, manages to get roped into it, and then decides, you know what, if I'm going to do this, we're going to try to do this the right way. Is That's essentially what I got from the third movie. Right. Whereas right. he wants to, where he wants to, you know, take things with it because he never wanted to be the gangster. He just sort of had to live, deal with the, play with the cards he was given. And Did of you... course, the way that, with the way that ends in the third one too, where ultimately his character's redemption is, or his, not his redemption, but his character's penance for the life that he lived was, is that all the good things in his life got sapped out of it. Yep. Did you ever see the thing on Paramount Plus that has, I think it's Paramount Plus, that shows the uh, the the semi-documentary on... Oh, no, I haven't, but I want to. I have not very, seen very it. Good. I, Adam, Very, very good. Adam, you great. saw it? Yeah. I, yeah. I thought it was real good. I thought it was real good. So, okay. Adam, where do, where do you think you'll be in five years? That'll be the question for all you guys. That's a great question. Hopefully, um, hopefully I'll be traveling. Uh, I, I honestly want to stay in Warren. I want to bring back the success to our town. Uh, but I do want to travel. I want to travel everywhere I can, you know, do jobs for whoever, you know, is willing to. And then I also want the award shows and I, you know, all the, all the glitz and glamour that comes with it. Um, I think in five years we'll still be working our butts off to get there because we've got a, a 10 year plan, not a five year plan. Um, uh, but I think that uh, we're already connecting to people and solidifying this, this idea that Ma Filmworks is the place to go if you want something done right. Um, and and I, I really credit Mike with that because like I said, I'm not the guy who went to college. I'm not the guy who has all this experience. I'm the writer, but I'm not the, the post-production. I'm not the music guy. Mike is. And uh, without him, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a prayer of success. But um, in five years, I hope to travel. I hope to uh, see my name, you know, on different people's stuff. I'm just happy to be in their projects as well as I am my own. And I hope to be making, you know, American Venom and, and Howitzer Tales and, and have some stuff on TV. And, you know, just be able to uh, start leaving a legacy in five years' time. Cool, cool. Todd? My answer is the same as Ben for pretty much all my life. I want to be the next Freddie or Jason or Michael Myers. I want to go for the rest of my life to go to conventions and get paid to sign my name and talk to people about horror movies. Cool. So that'd be one of your things. If you could get to an act in a, a horror franchise and become one of those characters, you're, you're, you're set. You're golden. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. What kind of what kind of uh, what kind of uh, creature, monster, or serial killer would you be, Todd? <laughs> well, Adam and I were talking about a thing about the Wendigo, but that's there's been like four movies about the Wendigo since I talked to him about it. Yeah, so we'll just uh, scratch that one off. I don't know. I saw I the know. first trailer about a week after we talked about it. By the way, I was like, "What? <laughs> no, really." Hmm. Because you'd have to be something iconic to actually get a couple movies under your belt because it'd be a, a franchise kind of character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Hmm. We could do it. We haven't figured it out yet, but we could definitely do it. There you go. Nice. And and that that could that right there, you could write something up right there. There he is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All and right. my other aspiration is I want to lead Gmo back to win the APWF Heavyweight Championship. <laughs> oh, oh my, that was a good one. All Clevified. <laughs> oh, he's and he's still crazy too. I bet he's. Oh yeah. He's of, yeah. God bless him. Oh my God. God bless him. 
those were some good times, brother. It was oh, yeah. Yeah. those were Michael five years from now. Five years from now. Do you know if you'd have asked me that two years ago, I might have told you a very different story. For me, it's never been about the glitz and the glamour and whatnot. I've always fancied myself a storyteller. But after 2021, when I got sick and then proceeded to get better through uh, the help of a very good legal team, uh, legal team, medical team, um, I kind of came out of that feeling a little bit different. Where do I want to be in five years? I want to be in a position in five years to where I can begin to give the people around me the lives that they deserve. Not because it's a, because it's not about me anymore. I spent so much time thinking I wasn't even going to be here five years from now that that's become ingrained into my mind now. Now, I want to build this film studio up to give these... We've got this whole community of local artists and stuff. And five years from now, I want to be in this position where I can give local artists, like Adam over here, the ability to take his son to Disney World, mostly because I'd like to go to Disney World too, and I don't plan on having children of my own, so I guess I'll have to live <laughs> vicariously. But anyway, like, I want to be in a position where we can give our people you know, the lives that they're sacrificing so much time and blood, sweat, and tears for. Mm. That's all mm. I've ever really wanted. Five nice. years from now, it, it, uh, it breaks down to this. Let me simplify it. It breaks down to this. Five years from now, I want to be able to look back at the previous five years and say that something I did in that five years made a difference, and that'll be good. Good enough. Well anyway. said. Well said. Very, very, very well said. Very well said. Adam, one word to describe you. Oh, um, realist. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Todd, one word. Weird. <laughs> Michael. Cut. Cut. <laughs> <laughs> Michael. <clears throat> Let's see. That's kind of a loaded question. One word to describe me. Heavyweight. And that has more than one meaning. Okay. <laughs> see, I have one word that describes all of you guys, and it's driven. And I only I only know Todd, and we haven't, you know, for many, many years, and just talking and listening to you two, uh, Michael and Adam, driven. If all three of you is what I would give you guys the word. Um, Cause it seems like to do what you have to do, you have to be driven um, to, to do these studios and do these movies. And, and sometimes you get turned down and you guys keep doing it. And Todd, you know, looking for bigger roles and wishing he, you know, boom, he gets, he keeps going driven, 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 driven. So I, I commend all three of you guys. And it's, and it's hard doing what you guys do. I'm sure it is. I, I, <laughs> I don't know if I could do the stuff. That, I definitely can't write because I, I, I think I had too many concussions to spell cat and it spell it backwards. But, um, <laughs> you know, but uh, where can um, people that listen to this podcast um, get a hold of each one of you guys? Uh, you know, you guys, this is your time to promote anything you guys want to <laughs> promote. Uh, tell everybody what's, you know, where to find you at. So, uh, Adam, go ahead. Uh, so Facebook for me, uh, Adam Ristau, you know, R-I-S-T-A-U. Uh, and uh, if you want my email, Adam Ristau, A-D-A-M-R-I-S-T-A-U, 64 at gmail.com. Uh, we've got awesome, a cool name coming up. We've got a lot of projects in the future coming up. Uh, if they're an actor and would like to connect with us, if they have a behind the scenes skill for crew, we need crew. We always need, need crew. For the record, indie films always need crew. Um, contact us. If they're interested in using our services, we're here. Uh, Ma Filmworks right now also has a Facebook page that we monitor regularly. Uh, so Ma Filmworks on Facebook. Uh, and we are building a website that's uh, what? www. What's the address, Mike? MaFilmworks.com. 
MaFilmworks.com. Okay. <laughs> Should have known that. Uh, but yeah, uh, MaFilmworks.com. It's in the uh, early stages of development, but we're, we're, you know, trying to make it, you know, look pretty right now. Uh, which is what's slowing it down. So uh, we'll have that up and running soon with uh, different pieces of information about all of us. And by all means, if they can reach out, please do. Cool, cool. Hollywood Johnny Tambo, how can people get a hold of you? Well, in addition to the Ma, you can get me on Facebook. It's uh, Todd Bob and Reith, B-O-B-E-N-R-I-E-T-H. Also, quotations, Hollywood Johnny Tambo. Uh, you can look for me on uh, Internet Movie Database, imbd, imbd.com. Uh, I don't really pay much attention to Instagram and Twitter. I'm sorry, X now. So those are the two predominant ones. Cool, cool. Michael. Well, you can also find me on Facebook. Um, my email address and phone number and stuff are private. Um so yeah, no, it's, I'm I'm joking, but I'm not joking. I'm a little bit more reclusive than these guys. I'm always available on Facebook for anybody that's looking for me, as long as they send me a message first explaining who they are and where they met me or where they found me at. Otherwise, I'm just likely to assume it's spam. It's just me. Right. I'm also available through the Ma Filmworks Company Facebook page, mm -hmm. and realistically that's about it for me i mean you can get a hold of me on youtube too i get comments on stuff occasionally i myself don't have much on youtube well i do i have a lot on youtube but it's i use my personal profile just as a sharing place for every for all these guys in down here we have the ma filmworks company youtube page i monitor that and do respond to comments and stuff there as well so yeah realistically facebook's the best way to get a hold of me i have a personal page still unfortunately <laughs> so i usually do the intake because uh he's he's not really a, a social media person whereas i have no life uh so <laughs> if, if if they reach out they'll probably get me first and then i'll i'll prod mike and be like hey you got someone worth talking to and and then he picks up right Oh, that's cool, though. Hey, guys, I appreciate this so much. I've learned a lot about the independent and the movie business and acting and all that stuff, which I didn't know before. So, um, everybody, I will have their link to their YouTube channel uh, on when I get all this stuff done because you have to, what's it called? Post or pre-production or how's it go? What's this, the is word? Post, this is post-production. You're heading post. to now. Yeah. Post. We're See? in production right now. This is post-production post happens after the recording stops. That's what I'm gonna do. So, guys, Michael, Todd, Adam, thank you guys so much. And uh, anything you guys have, um, you know, let me know through social media, and I will share it. Um, if you guys ever have something that you guys ever want to come on and make an announcement. You have this platform for however, and as long as I do podcasting, you guys can come on and, uh, you know, talk about your stuff, um, you know, that's coming. You can make announcements or whatever you guys need. Um, this platform is uh, to share whatever you guys got, because I appreciate uh, you guys coming on and taking your time to actually talk about the stuff that you guys love. So and uh, anybody that's come on the experience, I always try to help promote and do what I do. Cause it just, it makes the world a better place. I think so. Thank you. It's oh, our pleasure you. to be here. Honestly, I've been, I've been so excited to be here. Um, the last week was almost a downer for me because I was supposed to be at WrestleMania 40 and mm. just a series of, un of unfortunate events has happened where I wasn't able to be there, but in in retrospect i get to be here and i i've had a lot of fun today so well, thank god, you well god bless you adam i don't know if we finished the story <laughs> but the story was finished yesterday but <laughs> i do i do appreciate it so no thank you michael hollywood johnny tambo adam thank you guys so much and everybody thanks for tuning in to the triple b experience um i'm gonna get this out and you guys can uh, check them out ma filmworks company they have stuff coming on. They have uh, the movie will be Venom, which will be out sometime very soon. Oh, American yeah. Venom, not American Venom. Venom. Well, it's <laughs> got to differentiate there. Yeah, well, it could be Venom Four, and it could be huge. But American <laughs> Venom, and once once I uh, once those guys give me the stuff, um, I will share it to all the, me the media and all the masses that I do. So everybody, thanks for tuning in, guys. Thank you guys so much for coming on. 
And I wish you guys all the best in all your movies and movie productions. Thank you guys so much. Everybody, have a great night and a better tomorrow. And we'll see you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.